today we're going to continue looking at the farewell address and the final instructions that Jesus is giving his disciples. At this point in time, they are most likely just approaching the Garden of Gethsemane. They've already left the upper room. And within a matter of an hour or so, they will be coming to arrest him. And so Jesus is giving them these last minute instructions. And today he's going to give them some instructions with regards to their prayer and their prayer life. We have to imagine how many times in these three plus years that Jesus has prayed for his disciples. How many times he's prayed with his disciples. How many times they saw him pray. Matter of fact, at one time they even asked him, they were saying, Lord, teach us to pray like you do. Teach us to pray. But now if Jesus is leaving, who in the world is going to pray for them? Who in the world is going to stand up and speak to the Father on their behalf? And so they have to be wondering these things. And so Jesus is answering by giving them several promises concerning their prayer. And remember, these last instructions that he is giving uh, are in the context of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go, because when I go, the Holy Spirit is going to come. It's going to be much better for you. And it's in that context that he is now talking about their prayers. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at John. It's in chapter 16, 23 through 27. 23 through 27. And in that day, you will ask me no question. What's that day? Remember, he's talking about the day when he is going to be gone. That he is going to be crucified and he will be resurrected and he's going to heaven and the Holy Spirit is coming. He said, in that day, you'll ask me no question. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything, he'll give it to you in my name. Until now, you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will speak no more to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request the Father on your behalf. Oh, one more. Oh, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Three promises that he gives them dealing with their prayer. And the first one is, they will have in their prayer life direct access to God the Father. Four times in this little passage that I read, he keeps talking about in that day, in that day, in that day, that day when he's not going to be with them any longer. Remember, he's been praying for them. He ain't going to be there. In that day when he's not there, something else is going to happen to help them with their prayers. Well, it's the Holy Spirit is going to come and live inside of them, the Spirit of God. And they'll still be able to have their prayers heard by the Father, but they don't need Jesus to pray for them. They can do it themselves. That's what he says in verse 26. You will not need me to ask of the Father. I'm going to be gone. But you can still continue to pray to God the Father because the indwelling of the Spirit will be with you. I always think of the Spirit as being that, that conduit. When you have a radio, you have to have a transmitter and a receiver to get a message. And tell me anything, transmitter and receiver. Well, something has to get the information from one thing to the next. Well, that's what the Spirit does. If God transmits, we're the receiver. If we transmit, God is the receiver. How does the information get back and forth? Well, through prayer, the Holy Spirit makes that happen. Okay? And he says, you don't need me to do it. You can do it yourself. Because prayer, at its very foundation, is a conversation. Speaking, listening, talking. Speaking to God and listening to His voice. And it's a two-sided conversation. We forget. We pray a lot of times and we say amen and we run out the room. We forgot to listen to see if God had anything to say. We did all the talking. 
Our words come to God in spoken words, and sometimes what the Bible calls it, groanings too deep for words, uh, just a hurt, a sorrow. We, sometimes we just can't even put into words you know, what we feel. God knows these things. And so this is how we send our message out to God, but God's words come to us through His Scripture. It is His spoken word. If you want to hear what God says about something, it's in the book. Well, how do I find it? Well, you need to be reading it and studying it. Because it's the only way that you're going to know where it is when you need that. His words come to us in the Scriptures. And it's the Holy Spirit who then takes what is written here and applies it to our life so that we are able to understand it and use it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. God doesn't speak to us rarely, I will say. God can do it any way He wants. We don't have those burning bush encounters where the Lord is just audibly speaking to us. That doesn't happen. He doesn't need to do that anymore because everything He needs to tell us and everything we need to know is here. It's all there. You don't need anything else. So that's the first thing. The apostles are told, the disciples are told, and we are told, we have direct access to the Father. We don't need Jesus here, coming up here, standing next to me, offering a prayer for you. We can do it ourselves. Second promise. It is the power of the name of Jesus Christ. It is the power of His name. Three times in this passage, Jesus tells His disciples to pray in His name. Pray in His name. If you want your prayers to be effective, if you want them to be heard, if you want them to be answered, if you want all of these things to happen in your prayer life, you need to pray in the name of Jesus. Now, we do this. I do this. I get to almost every prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's just it's automatic. That's not what it's talking about here. Just saying the name of Jesus at the end of the prayer is not like saying Abracadabra. <laughs> and it all happened. It's not like that. It's not a tagline. We pray in the name of Jesus and are told to pray in the name of Jesus because His name is so much more than any human name could possibly be. We have to lift it up a little bit more. You read through the New Testament, once you get past the Gospels and the Christ has died and been resurrected, and then all the letters that are written about how to, uh, as Christians should, should act and, and answers to uh, about salvation and these things, um, you read through time and time and time again, you find the full name of Jesus. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's His name. The Lord Jesus Christ. The. The. That means one. There's only one. The. The. Lord. When we read the word Lord in the Bible, that is the English translation of the Hebrew word for Yahweh or Jehovah. When you see Lord Jesus in there, it is, it is the same if they said Jehovah Jesus. God Jesus. By being Lord, He is divine. He is holy. He is God. Jesus even asked one time if they were all around calling Him Lord. He goes, why do you call me Lord? Lord? Why are you calling me God? God. When you don't do what I tell you. You don't do what I say. If we call Jesus the Lord of our life, we're calling Him our God. And if God tells us to do, well, you know, I don't really like when he says this. I don't really agree when he says this over here. Well, it's God. <laughs> you need to agree. I give you, because there's only one of you that's wrong. <laughs> but God be right and every man a liar. Lord, his God in the flesh, the Lord, then there's Jesus. The word Jesus. Again, our translations, you go from the Hebrew and then it's translated into the Greek and in some cases into Latin. and then So it's gone from several different languages. 
But if you go back to the beginning, the word Jesus is the Greek form. That's what we have. It comes from the Greek. The Greek form of the name Yeshua. Yeshua. And that name means, the meaning of that name is Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is. So if you call him Lord, that means you're calling him Jehovah. Then if you call him Jesus, you're saying he's the salvation. He is salvation. When the angel appeared to Joseph, remember when uh, Joseph left Mary, when she found, he found out she was pregnant, and uh, he didn't understand the, the virgin birther, and he left, and an angel appeared to him, and kind of explained the things, and told him to go back. Remember what the angel told him? And you shall call his name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. You're going to call him Jesus because he is Jehovah salvation. That is his name. The one and only Lord God, Jesus, salvation, Christ. Again, translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, which we read and understand as Messiah. The Messiah. And that word means the anointed one. The one who has been picked and chosen and set apart for a particular divine task. Chosen by God and set apart for service. Jesus is the one, the only one, who was appointed by God to perform the work for man's salvation. There is salvation in no other name. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death. And He was risen from the grave to create a pathway of resurrection to all believers according to God's will and God's plan. He was the one anointed to make this happen. Now to believe these things, that He is God, He is our salvation and the only means of salvation. And that he is anointed and sent by God to perform that task that no one else could do. This is the absolute minimum definition of what it means to be a Christian. You have to believe these things 100% in order to be a Christian. To believe one or two or kind of think it might be kind of, you're not a Christian. I'm sorry. You're not. You have to, this is the minimum. But not only is this the minimal thing, but it tells us one more thing, that without this understanding, without being a Christian, no one can expect God to hear their prayers. If you're going to deny His Son in any way, regard, why would God bother to even listen to you? You've got nothing to say that He's interested in. If you are not a Christian, don't bother. Because the only prayer that he really has promised to hear is your prayer of confession and repentance. And that you would give your life to Christ and believe these basic tenets. Other than that, if you're sick and you're not a Christian, it does you no good to pray for healing. What makes you think God would answer your prayer? What makes you think He would even bother to hear it? Someone has written that prayer is a family privilege. God hears the prayers of His children. And again, outside of prayers of confession and repentance and the turning from sin to God, God is under no obligation or inkling to even hear or listen to your prayers or petitions. He's not interested. So praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ means to acknowledge who He is and what He has done according to the Scriptures. Not according to man, but according to what God has said. That the Lord, God, Jesus, the Savior, Christ, the one who is anointed and sent by God, is the one who loves you enough to die for you. But also praying in His name means to pray according to His character, according to His attributes, according to His will and His purpose. See, we have to offer up our prayers in His name 
according to his merit and not our own. Let's say tomorrow I go to the bank. Got me a fancy check. Okay? It's made out of my, to my name. It's for $100,000. And the signature at the bottom is Daffy Duck. <laughs> you think I can get that cash? Well, there's a problem, isn't there? Other than my mental state. But Daphne ain't got no money in the bank. They got nothing to draw from. They can't go back there and look at his account and go, yeah, no, Daphne's loaded. Yeah, let's give Ed some of his money, which is what you do when you cash the check. You take somebody else's money and you put it in your account. They're not going to do that. Now, if I walked in tomorrow and I had a check for $100,000, it was signed by Donald Trump. I guarantee you there's enough money in that bank to cover it. There's enough treasury in the treasury. They would go, yeah, it won't even make a dent. And they'll take it out and give it to me. So the name of the check tells you everything about the treasury that's there. The value of what's there. My merit, what I have done, what I have accomplished, and the things that I've done have added nothing to the treasury in heaven. <coughs> nothing. But Jesus fills the treasure. Jesus owns everything. And so when I go to God in prayer, I don't pray on my merit because I can't trust that I can withdraw anything. I've got nothing in there. But if I want grace, if I want comfort, if I want peace, if I want answers, I'm going to draw on the account from Jesus Christ. So to pray in His name means not to pray in our name for our merit. We are drawing on Him. He is our merit. And one more thing about praying in His name. Because we people, we read this all the time. Man, if I just pray this and say in Jesus' name at the end, He said He'll give it to me. Well, that's not what He says. Because you're not praying in His name unless... You pray for exactly what Jesus Christ would pray for in the exact same circumstance. See, if you're praying according to His character and His will, and for His honor and His glory, you pretty much have to be in line with what He would want. You've got to only ask for what Jesus would want. What was that? WWJW. What would Jesus want? What would Jesus want in this circumstance? Now we have to start thinking not about ourselves not, and start thinking about Him. Yeah. That's why James says we pray, but we don't get answers to so many of our prayers because we ask, He says, I miss. That means we pray with the wrong motives. Our prayers are all based on what we want. We have to ask, what would Jesus want? What would Jesus want? So how in the world am I supposed to know what Jesus would want? By reading, and studying, and meditating on what he said. What he has told us. Keep in mind, everything we need to know is there. There's no more extra chapters. There's no more books coming. It's all there. And when we read and we know and we study the scriptures, then the Holy Spirit that God has placed inside of us we have longings, we have yearnings, we have needs, we have wants. Is this right? How should I pray? And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will help us in our prayers. Because we often do not know how to pray properly. Because we're praying for ourselves and in ourselves. So promise one is that a disciple of Christ will have direct access to God. You don't need a priest. You don't need a prophet. You don't need a pastor. To talk to God. You can do it on your own. Promise two is that when we pray, it's to always be in His name. According to His will, according to His purpose, and according to His power. And timing. Promise three is a promise of joy in prayer. That was in verse 24. Now we think a lot of times, I'll tell you, I will have a lot of joy in prayer if God gives me what I ask. Right? Isn't that how we think? As long as I pray and it comes to fruition, I'll have joy. 
Now that's kind of happiness. But it's nothing wrong with having joy when God hears our prayers and petitions and grants it. When we have a loved one, or we're sick, or we're hurting, and we pray and God heals, then there is a reason for joy. Rejoice! Again, I say rejoice! We rejoice when, when our grandkids are born, and our children have children, and, and we rejoice that the new birth is coming to this world. Oh, we rejoice, we thank God, we pray for a successful birth and it happened. We rejoice. We rejoice when someone we know and care about and love accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. We have joy when it comes to salvation. It's okay to pray for things and have joy when it happens. Or maybe you were in a church somewhere. You were unhappy and God was leading you somewhere else and you prayed, Lord, if you would just send me to a good Bible-believing church. And He led you here. There's a reason for joy. He answers your prayer. You see, God answers prayers because He loves us. But we have to understand that we don't get all the answers the way that we would have in our time. So it doesn't have to come true for us to have joy. The greatest reason we can have joy in prayer is the very fact that our petition, our prayers, are an extension of our personal, deep, and close relationship with God. It is our conversation. That we can just sit down in the morning, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and sit and just have a chat with God. Just talk with Him. And you go, well, that doesn't seem very holy. That's what prayer is, people. It's what prayer is. It's talking to God. And you really should have joy in that, knowing that He's never busy. You don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to say the right words. You can pray without using the language in the King James Bible. God will hear you even if you don't say thee, thus, and thou. Amen. He wants to hear His children. And it's an incredible joy to know that we are able, as fallen, sinful creatures, that we can at any time go and stand in His holy presence and speak with Him. Knowing who His Son is. Knowing what He has done for us. Knowing how much He loves us. And knowing how great His plans are for us. Today, tomorrow, and forever. Direct access to the Father because He desires all of His children to come and speak with Him. Now, He does expect some reverence and humility, but He wants you to come. The power of righteous prayer that is prayed in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ because we know when we pray that way, our prayers are heard. And the joy of prayer. It's a simple, inexplicable joy that comes from the realization that we can actually stand before a holy God, before the creator and sustainer of everything that is or will ever be, and we're allowed to speak to Him as we would speak to a very dear friend. It's the source of joy. But wonderful promises go unfulfilled when we fail to pray as we ought. This passage this morning should both challenge us and encourage us to examine how we view prayer. May we all seek the passion and the purpose for prayer in our daily lives. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father God, even as we were speaking up about prayer, Lord, we lift up our minds and our hearts to you right now. Lord, thank you for loving us, saving us, blessing us, and allowing us, Lord, to come to you at any point in time. This world is hard. This world is difficult. It can be quite a trial. But throughout it all, we can always know that we can come to you. And you love us. And you care for us. And you want what's best for us. Help us to feel that freedom to draw near to you every day.